right, everybody, welcome back to Practice the Pitch. Thank you, everyone who's been tuning in and checking these out. Thanks to all the artists who are submitting songs. We appreciate it. And I want to welcome Brad from Goatee Records. Welcome, Brad. Hey, nice to be here, man. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, man, absolutely. So let's just dive in. If you want to give everybody a bit of a a background, you know, your your story coming into music, and then hopefully something that you can share with us that you're excited about that's coming up would be great. Yeah, my name's Brad. Uh, I've been in Nashville for 20 years and been in music for 20 years. I graduated from Penn State with a uh, major in communications. I was working at a radio station there, also at a newspaper. And when I graduated college, I knew I wanted to be in either New York, LA, uh, or Nashville to work in music. And so the summer after I graduated, I came to Nashville for a job interview with a management company. And my dad recommended that I pass my my resume around to other record labels and publishing companies to see if anything would happen. And a company called Goatee Records offered me an unpaid internship. And so I had to decide between the unpaid internship or the job with the management company. A friend of mine who was doing telesales, which for those of you who don't know what telesales is, back in the day, you would call retail stores and ask them to buy your CD of your from your yeah. artists and things like that. And he said, look, I think you'll, you'll, learn, you'll learn more from the industry by being at a record label. You'll see yeah. all the departments and all facets of what you want to do. So I took the unpaid internship. Uh, at the time, there wasn't rules for internships, so I interned 40 hours a week. I waited tables at a diner five nights a week, and then that turned into a job part-time, and then it moved into a full-time thing. I did that for about two years. I thought maybe, uh, you know, this will last a few years, and I'll go back to Pennsylvania, but I did it for two years and then pitched the owners of Goatee Records an idea to have a sub-label, and um, it was called Mono versus Stereo, and the catch was they completely owned it, but they gave me pretty much creative control to do what I wanted within budget realms, you know what I mean? Yeah. as long as I kept everything within the certain budget they gave me. And so I did that for five or six years, punk, hardcore, metal, indie rock, all that kind of stuff. Stepped away for about a year after that and worked at a merch company. And then Goatee called me back in uh, 2008 and said, hey, would you want to come back? And so now I've been back for another 12 years. So 20 wow. years of music, 19 plus at Goatee Records. Because even when I was running Mono versus Stereo, I was still doing Goatee stuff. I had to, yeah. until the label could make money, I had to do something else. And so I ran Goatee stuff as well. So yeah. I don't know, I've seen a lot, man, in 20 plus years. I've worked in a lot of different styles of music, worked in different genres as well. And uh, I don't know, I just love it. I mean, Goatee Records is home. Uh, if people don't know about it, it was started in 1994 by an artist um, who was, there was a big band in the 90s called DC Talk. And Toby was one of the members of that band and started this label yeah. with his cousin. And so it's family and it's 25 plus years and I've been there for 20 some of them. And that's it's awesome. just five of us in a small little house in downtown Franklin, Tennessee. We're an independent record label. There's no investment from other record labels or a big distribution company or some company over in Sweden. It's just us yeah. doing it, thugging it out every day. So Yeah, I love that. And not a lot of people, you know, necessarily know that some of the indies that they love are less indie than they think because there is a lot of investment in from different people, possibly even maybe maybe one of the majors is right in there, like, hey, we like what you're doing and they're, you know, controlling some of it. So that indie indie is pretty cool, right? It's, it is. And and you know, in the nineties a lot of artist labels started. It was yeah. kind of the thing to do. And mm -hmm. that doesn't happen much anymore. And yeah. let it alone is there one still around from the nineties. You know, right. God willing, we've been very fortunate. We've made a lot of mistakes, but uh, we've also made some good decisions too. And we're still here and it's a lot of fun. That's so. awesome. I was looking through some of your bio stuff and some of your, your past interviews that you've given. And you, you gave your five artists list, I think in an all access was the link that I had. And I was like, oh man, we have the, like the same five artists. So um, <laughs> loving, you know, Foo Fighters and, and you two major influences in, in my life. But I also came out of Christian music on the come up, like for me, being raised in a Christian home with a, a with a pastor, you know, my dad loved the Beatles. He loved you too, but he didn't tell us about that because he was scared we'd go <laughs> and like find him. So I actually found my first Beatles record. I found, uh, you know, from a friend and he came home and I'm jam and jamming Abbey Road. And he's like, oh, I love this record. I was like, what? <laughs> no, you know, so I expanded out, but I mean, I came up on all the DC talk stuff and, and uh, audio adrenaline and, you know, all the, all the Christian music. And then, you know, tooth and nail was probably the most impactful culture in my life for a long time. Tooth and nail ran the show for me as a teenager. Yeah, so I know the history and, and have so much respect for it. Share with us something that you're excited about that you're working on, you know, that you're excited about. And then I'd love to hear what, you know, follow up question to that. What gets
gets you excited about music when you hear it for the first time? Well, I mean, look, I'm a lot like you. I, I grew up, I was weird too, where I, I was listening to Michael W. Smith. I bought Eye to Eye. There's an album called Eye to Eye in 1988, I think it was. I bought a cassette tape. He came to Hershey, Pennsylvania on the Go West Young Man album tour and yep. DC Talk opened. It was the first time I ever saw DC Talk. He came again a few years later on the Change Your World tour and had DC Talk open for him again. So I'm okay. DC Talk came in headline in 1994 on the Free at Last World tour. Smitty actually made a surprise guest appearance and that was the start of all of it. But at the same time that I was listening to those artists, I was getting exposed to Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Boys mm -hmm. to Men, all the early 90s hip hop stuff, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre. I was listening to all that stuff. And then yeah. I think it was about 94, 95. Back then there was a company called Interlink that would help distribute music into churches and to youth groups. Mm -hmm. And I got a copy of a band called Wish for Eden and they were the first yeah. tooth and nail release. Yep. And then I just got like you, I got sucked into that entire culture. And so I was living in like the tooth and nail world, but it was also because I was a massive DC Talk fan, I was listening to all the goatee stuff. And so I always had this thought of, if I do go to Nashville, it'd be awesome to be at goatee records. Yeah. Never thought that that would <laughs> happen, but it did. And yeah. I think that a lot of what drives me now is what drove me back then. It's just a love for music. Like I, yeah. I look forward to release dates. I've got albums pre-saved into my Apple Music account. I buy tickets to shows when I can. I'm really excited because a bucket list artist of mine, I'm supposed to go see this fall. The show was supposed to be last year. It got moved to this fall, but Rage Against the Machine, yep. uh, with Run the Jewels was playing. And I never saw them in the 90s because I just couldn't get to a show. So I'm st I still geek about it. I'm in the U2 fan club. I get all the fan That's club right. subscribers stuff you know what i mean so yeah i i'm in it you know what i mean and, and i love music and consume a lot i will say i'm not as like i think as you get older it is harder to keep up with just all the amount of young artists and what's current on the top 40 and things like that i just i'm not in there you know what i mean right. every now and then there's a band or an artist that like sneaks in every i would say about every year there's probably like two new young artists that kind of just sneak into my music consumption somehow and over the last few years there's been quite a few young bands that i just have been really excited about because they're just they're just grabbing their friends and they're grabbing their instruments and they're yeah. just jamming like yeah. they you do back in the day and it's yep. exciting me that there's still artistry in that way you know what yep. I mean that kind of is still there for me man that is so on point I think you know the purpose of, of this show this vidcast podcast is to just kind of show bridge the gap between industry professionals and artists who who don't always get the interactions and yep. I think hearing a couple of different things that you said are so on point you love music people who work in this industry are in this industry still especially after the 2008 crash people are in this industry uh, because they love it you know as the money starts to come back in you're going to have more sharks show up sure but people are in this industry because they love it you can make a lot more money in other industries right so absolutely i mean um, i tell artists all the time i don't ever think i don't think especially in nashville it's not like there's intentionality on a record label's part to hurt an artist's career they make wrong decisions sometimes right. but no one's actually out to get anybody those days of like oh if i just get one song I can sell the CD for eighteen ninety nine and make a crap ton of money. That's yep. that's like that's long gone. Now that's it's like gone. you said, if you're here, it's because you love music and you truly want to help an artist. Yep, yep. And you know, I think the other thing that you said too, though, that is equally as much is that when you've been working for a while in the industry, some of your exposure may not be as high as people think. Like we're not, everyone's not plugged into like what the next hottest thing is because you end up in a in a bubble. And so it's really about making sure that you know, as an artist artists that who are you talking to and what it what is their bubble and are they going to understand what you're doing or not and kind of coming into it under knowing whether or not they're going to understand what you're doing and not necessarily having too much anticipation one way or the other and one of the things that's been fun in this in the pitch process is to hear from some professionals who might be like oh yeah you know I'm not really sure what I would do with this or whatever and it's like that that's good for artists to hear because you know I think they kind of think that sometimes that a professional is like, oh, I know exactly what to do. And it's like, I tell artists all the time, if you're meeting with a record label, a manager, a booking agent, and if they have an answer for everything, or if they can't say that there's one thing that they do not so well, right? Right. And you should probably walk because even for us, myself for 20 years like I think there's a pro and con to everything in life and that doesn't mean like super positive and super, neg super negative sure. but there's a flip side to every coin yep. you can go meet with a big record label and there's massive opportunities that come along with that you can meet with an indie record label and there's massive opportunities and there's flip sides to those 
as well. Yep. A big record label can maybe have going to have more funds, like a bigger staff. But if you don't turn on that return on investment pretty quick, you may be gone. At a smaller yep. record label, you may not have that immediate influx of cash or the big sexy billboards and all that kind of stuff. But you're going to have a record label that's going to stick around for you for your first five radio singles if they don't work. And then radio single number six is the one that takes off. Yep. So yep. there's just a flip side to just about everything. And I think it's always good for artists to know that when they walk into meetings, they should say, look, what are some things you do well? And what are some things that you guys are trying to work on? Not that you do bad, but what are some areas that your company that you're trying That's to fix? That's a great question. You know what I mean? I think the more that artists can get that, they can get a more well-rounded approach from a manager, an agent, a publisher, a record label about really what that company is good at and what yeah. they're working on. And how does that fit that artist kind of mentality? You know what yeah. I mean? To find the right fix for that. You know? I love so. that. Well, awesome, man. Thanks for thanks for sharing those. Uh, let's jump in and listen to some music, shall we? Yeah, man. Awesome, man. Well, uh, let me pull up our submissions here. If you are watching, you can submit over at practice the pitch com submissions are always open we are filming these in seasons so we'll announce our guests over the facebook page and stuff like that and if you see a guest and you go hey i want them to hear my music you can submit and put in a note who the guest is for or you can just submit at any time and uh, our team is listening to everything and curating the shows just based off of who's coming on so go over and submit a song all right let's see who we got here our first uh submission artist is called arrows rising and they're elevator pitch to us is we are a pop band living near Grand Rapids, Michigan. We've been playing for about two years and have a heart for our younger generation. Awesome. And without further ado, we'll listen to Arrows Rising. Here we go. the sun again down on my knees again don't know what to say besides for i should pray looking into your eyes feel god's presence tonight you'll be by my side through all the lies guide me with your light got a hold on me so I can finally breathe now I'm not suffocating God has set me free all right that was arrows rising take us in Brad what are, what are we thinking first first thoughts on the on the tune here well first off it's always hard I mean I sit in song meetings all the time with artists and when you hear something for the very first time and you're trying to give a critique right off the bat it's it's really a difficult thing and sometimes it takes multiple listens to kind of really get a sense of the song and what someone's trying to say to me but sometimes a first impression the first listen your instinct your gut of certain things does kind of hold true but then sometimes you listen through more you can kind of fine tune it but the first thing I would say is I think the, the singer's got a really really good voice I'm weird in the sense of like I do have always enjoyed and liked when a song is titled like the hook of the song you know and yeah I didn't I don't think that's the case with this I was looking to find lyrics and I couldn't find them on YouTube that's just like a that's just my personal opinion it's just like there was a, you know there's a Kings of Leon song years ago and they called it radioactive but the hook of the song was something completely different and if the title of the song would have been the hook I think it might have even been a bigger song you know right right um that's a sort of pet peeve second thing is I kind of wanted the chorus to explode more I I have always been a fan of on your first verse get into your first course quicker maybe yeah. sometimes remove a pre or, or a walk in and just get into that first course put your pre back in on your before your second course yep. but in that first little bit I think you should just always get to the course quicker so in this I think there was a pre in that I'm like ah, I think you can maybe take that out and then get into the chorus but then in the same instance I, I was feeling like the end of that first verse I kind of felt like all of a sudden something was going to happen then it kind of went into a pre thing and then I guess this was the course right so that's some of my initial just it's great critique. 
it's yeah. great. You know, I, one thing I want to point out here for people watching is know who's listening to your music and and think about what is happening. There's two things you said that I think is really interesting. Hearing a song multiple times, also referring to the fact that we are music fans. So, you know, there's an element of marketing that can take place in just like if a music industry professional has any exposure to you before going into a meeting, or if you've done a good job of curating an experience where they can have an idea of what you're all about before, you know, before a listening session is obviously great. But then also thinking about the things that you just said, getting to a chorus pretty quickly. You know, I thought the intro, I thought the vocal could just come in because I agree. I think there's a really great voice here. I could have heard that sooner and would have mm -hmm. been engaged sooner. That doesn't mean all of your songs have to be that way. Right. Because fans may not want that. So when thinking about the fact like, hey, I'm getting this in front of an industry person, maybe pick the song that's a great song or when you're selecting for radio, it might be the same case too. But thinking objectively about the songs you're picking to send where they're sending, there might be one that's really great for fans who have a better understanding of who you are. And if you're like a chill artist and it's going to take a minute to get where we're going and they know that, that might be fine for fans. But when you're sending it out and getting feedback on it, getting to the point quickly is going to be meaningful for that. So I think it's a good point there, you know? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's like, you know, if you're meeting with a publishing company, if you're meeting with the songwriting division or the film and TV division, there's two totally different pitches that need to happen there. Absolutely. Songwriting division needs to be about your songwriting powers. Your film and TV needs to be about something that's going to sound good, a good track, a good hook that's going to resonate for about 15 yep. seconds on TV. Yep. And those are two totally different, two, usually two totally different, different types of songs, you know? I oh, will say on this though, I was actually kind of impressed for like a young up and coming artist, like 1200 views and being only on YouTube for a month was actually like, okay, that's something yep. people are yep. listening to that. You know what I mean? Yep. So watching um, it, viewing it. And yeah. also the thing that we love about this and I love about this show is you've got an artist who's already showing like they're paying attention. Like it's, we just started this show. We're posting like, this is not a well-known show of any kind. We're posting primarily the submissions are coming in from Facebook groups across the country, right? If we're just saying, hey, if you want to get your song out, that means that these artists are paying attention, looking for opportunities and engaging. So the first rule of, of success is showing up, right? And so I love with the artists they are showing up and hopefully everybody's taking, a, you know, things away from this of like how to approach. And the biggest thing is the voice is going to carry. This artist's voice, I think will carry. And then it's about getting the songs and maybe those songs are there and having those conversations with a team member or a family member or friend of like, hey, if you were listening to this for, for the first time what would you think or you know having having some that's why we call it practice the pitch it's about hey maybe go practice like get some opportunity to practice with maybe your, well, i mean look your I mean, friend, one you know? thing that's really cool you've got links in there which is really great on the youtube channel i would recommend you should put your your lyrics in there you should put who the yeah. songwriter is in there all that kind of stuff helps so that you can't ever expect someone to go to a second link or a third link or a fourth link or try to find something like it's all got to be right there in every location every yeah. single time so yeah. the links they've got all their platform links in there They've got all the links to their socials, which is Drop great. I would, uh, yeah, put the lyrics in there and put your songwriters in there. That way everybody knows. Because look, yeah. what if you, what if that song was written at, at some Nashville songwriting camp with a songwriter that I just happen to know? It's like, oh, well, then I could go, hey, Jeff, did you write with this artist? Yeah. I just heard this on this podcast. You know, you never know how that circle is going to connect. How it's going to so. circle around. It's totally true. Well, all right. We're going to take a little break and we're going to come back with Erskine for our zero to 60 featured artists. So everybody stick around. Thanks for tuning in. And we will be right back. See you in a bit. All right, welcome back to Practice the Pitch. And we have Erskine here with us. Erskine was a zero to 60 uh, artist with us last year. And it's good to see you again. Man, just give everybody, the viewers and, and everybody, just the background, what you've been up to, what you're excited about, what you're all Yeah, about. great to be back. Feel like the HED family is strong. And uh, it's been pretty neat to uh, walk through a season where we've continued to do some new releases. It's sort of maybe an untraditional time. Really enjoyed uh, some of the feedback that we've gotten as well as probably every artist and musician that's out there learning how to do new things. <laughs> yeah. and there's the uh, the rise and fall of that, learning how to, to fail at some things, but also learning how to be successful in a variety of new ways, uh, sort of in this season that we're in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to jump in. We're going to review a track called Be Brave. And here we go with Erskine, Be Brave. All right. Surrounded by people watching me They're 
watching me Watching my every single move Something special is rising up Yeah, it's rising up Coming from deep inside of me Like a flame, it's the passion of my life You can see it when you look into my eyes I'll never be the same, yeah Love makes me who I am today that was Erskine with Be Brave. Tell us about this song and and give us that give us that pitch, Erskine. So, we've got the title Be Brave, which comes at an interesting time in sort of world history uh, for our catalog. It is probably the most upbeat song that we've done. It's really a song that tries to bring together some of the elements of dance, some of the elements and themes that are related to just, you know, moving people forward instead of being stuck sort of in a in a past motion. So this again is most upbeat song that we've done. It's got some dance elements to it. And we're, you know, we're really excited to release it. Awesome. Very cool. Brad, tell us what you're thinking. First off, man, I like the tone of your voice. It reminds me of Seal. It was an artist from like the late 90s, early mid late 90s. Uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I love <laughs> Seal. Um, yeah, ding. <laughs> ding. <laughs> ding. We got a ding. All right, cool. There was also like some like 80s, what I heard of like some Phil Collins and <gasps> like kind of like late 80s, early 90s, like sounds in there that I thought were really cool. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I That's think a it's looking thing. good. Oh, yeah, keep on going. I, you get, all the musical influences are coming out. My biggest takeaway was I thought the, the hook line, love makes me who I am today, makes me want to be brave, was really, really cool. I personally, and I, look, I'm just a very direct person, so I'll just say it. I do think there's a disconnect happening in some of the lyrics with that hook that you have in the song. Meaning, like, I don't know if that connects so much about, I know you're trying to, like, convey this upbeat message and dance vibe in there with some of the other lyrical pieces you're saying about putting your hands up and things like that, but I think you have a really strong, like, when I hear that, love makes me who I am today, makes me want to be brave. I want to hear more about, like, that. More about you. More about your story. Maybe less about trying to get people to put their hands up in the air. Because mm -hmm. I think that line makes me want to, okay, he has something he's trying to say. You know what I mean? And so I would encourage you to to maybe think about like, can I build off of that and make it more, not necessarily a storytelling song, but put more components around that lyric that would fit what you're trying to say to have it be a, that much more of a message than just some phrases that we would hear in other things. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm trying to say it in the most encouraging way, like the direct way I possibly can. You know what I mean? Sure. I love that. Um, love it. Some of the track stuff, even though I, I hear some things that are like, remind me of some late 80s, early 90s, you know, Phil Collins and Genesis and uh, all that kind of stuff stuff there is some stuff in there too that it's like okay when you go into that world it's like you have to like make sure that it's a nod to it but it doesn't sound dated so and there also is some production elements that i feel like okay this does remind me at times of like walking into some like there's like a store i can think of i'm like this feels like the background music i would hear in the store when i'm walking around and so there's a balance of like trying to honor your influences but also not make it feel like it's too dated from a production standpoint i personally would like to hear the hear the song just like stripped down a guitar i'm always a thing a fan of like if if the song doesn't translate acoustic then it probably shouldn't be a song. If everything that we're pitching about a song is just the track, the track, the track, I'm not saying you're doing that, but anybody in general, it's like, well, then should the song exist? You know what I mean? Now, maybe that's cool for like full on EDM music where it's just all dance and it's all 808s and beats and stuff. But when you have a song and then you have a song like yours where you have something you're trying to say, like it needs to, that needs to be the first and foremost. You know what I mean? Like, is the song saying something? Is the song important to you? Will it resonate? Those kind of key things. And if it can do that acoustic, like that was the first thing after listening to that, I'm like, I would love to hear that stripped down. Knowing you play guitar and sometimes you do with a band and stuff, it's like I'd like to hear how you would how you would do it without yeah. all the other stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think what I think is so cool, Erskine, about this conversation. What's so cool about music and what you said about learning these new things in this time is that all of those things are so accessible to do now. Like songs get dropped with like 19 different versions, mm -hmm. right? So I'm so excited about the acoustic version that you maybe are already working on, or after this are going to go crank out right you can go turn it around i think also the story
storytelling element is like, hey, let's take this song deeper. Man, TikTok blowing things up with being able to take little portions of songs. And then, so I love, you know, to have a song just have so much bigger of a world around it than just the song itself. And what's so cool about where we're at in media these days is that, you know, expanding on those stories is super accessible and super easy to do uh, with multiple versions and things like that. Tell us, yeah. are there any multi versions and what is some of the, uh, what is some of the background of that story that you want to share from love makes me who I am today? Yeah. So the song started as an acoustic song. It's really funny to get the responses because I've played that song probably to tons of open mics and at some of my performances. And then people get a chance to hear that version of it. And it's like, Oh, that's the same song. That's it's yeah. incredible because it does kind of give that the acoustic vibe is just it's going to be different than, than what that is and so there's some that enjoy one or the other and, and that's always a great experience just to kind of see where people register with that but there's yeah there's, there's always some underlying themes that are there you know when I do podcasts and stuff I get a chance to explore a little bit more of those really hard to do that in a three minute 30 second song but uh, totally. it gives me a lot of material to talk about afterward and that song comes from sort of the locus of a lot of other things that I'm doing like the opening lyrics I'm surrounded by people watching me watching me watching my every single move that really comes from just sort of this leadership you know vantage point that I find myself in a lot where there's people who are watching me and having to respond and then just trying to figure out what that dude is different like what why is he different and so like that the whole course that comes in love makes me who I am today kind of builds on that but there's yeah there's some you found Brad you did a good job finding some of those uh those tricky spots that I put in there and some of those traps doors i love cool. that i love that i mean look right. you, you definitely you, your voice like you definitely have a sweet spot in that like acoustic you know that kind of the late 90s early 2000s kind of like that trip hop stuff that was really popular where you had the acoustic and you had like subtle beats laying underneath it like that seems to be like a sweet spot so i would encourage you to keep doing that but also make sure that that it, it fits in the right pocket and doesn't get too distracting at times you know what i mean everything else is going on that the message of what you're trying to say your voice cuts through the most you know so mm -hmm. love that's it. great thanks Erskine, uh, while while we have Brad, any questions, any ideas you have, any advice you're looking for as as we move through the rest of this year and your career, or just any thoughts that you'd like to share? Yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, there's so much that you have done and you guys are hearing so many different things. Any of the latest, you know, information or maybe trajectory that you see that maybe I'd be able to incorporate in techniques, outreach from the plethora of experience that you have? Man, I would just, I, I just always want to encourage like, you know, all the other tech stuff and the platforms and all that stuff comes and goes and changes and everything, right? So to me, it's, it's always about song. If you, let me back up and just say this, one, nobody's going to care more than you do. So don't ever put your hopes in any other partnership or relationship to do something. You need to care more than anybody else and you need to work harder than anybody else. Even if you land partnerships with a management company, a booking agency, a publishing company, or a record label, you still got to work harder. You got to make up all the difference that you're giving all those people at them becoming your partner. So that's number one. Number two, it's all about songs. At the end of the day, it's all about songs, no matter what genre you're in and encouraging people to continue to write. I've told a lot of artists that I've worked with this past year that I think last year should have been the most fruitful time for songwriters because when everybody's quarantined and locked down, what else you got to do? You should be writing a song. And and so I think continually to write and write and write and constantly challenge yourself. There's a lot of artists last year that said, I'm just going to write a song a day. I'm going to challenge myself to write a song a day. And that kind of stuff goes leaps and bounds into your career. I've worked with so many artists where we did two years of development and we did four rounds of 20 song sessions that we would do 20 songs over the course of six months, come down and listen. Okay, what do we like? What do we not like? Then go on to the next batch, the next batch. So at the end of the day, over two years, an artist is writing between 80 to 100 songs that we had to sift through and be like, okay, so moving forward, to actually release something is there something in this and how do we want to yeah. do it but that was just sharpening their teeth you know what i mean and grinding it out and figuring out who they wanted to be and what they wanted to say so i think working really hard in the song and that's the kind of stuff it sounds so like trite in some ways but i think a lot of artists nowadays get lost in all the, the tech stuff and the social networks and everything else when it, at the end of the day it comes down to songs you know what i mean and yeah. and then working really really hard because it i mean look man back in the day i mean i was <laughs> sleeping in a van and washing, getting a bath in a freaking Walmart parking lot and sleeping overnight and playing for the sound guy in the opening band. And that was it. I mean, that's, that's grinding it out. Right. And when you're willing to do that for your music, it goes a long way. It pays off when you're, no matter how big you are later down the road, you always remember those times when you were really, really grinding it out. And so that kind of work ethic is extremely important in so many areas, not just in music, but in life. Mm -hmm. Right. So I always try to press in on that more than some of the other stuff, the work ethic stuff, you got to care the most and work harder than anybody else. No matter if you have 
have a team of people around you or not, you still got to do all the work. And then if you're the songwriter, constantly writing songs, constantly writing songs. And and also I would say that like, I do think that this is going to sound really weird, but I think reading is like an underrated thing nowadays. I think increasing your vocabulary, I'm not saying just you, I'm just saying in general, but like Everyone. it's such an underrated yeah. thing. You know what I mean? Is to just read, man. I mean, that's what Eminem did, right? That guy yeah. read and read and read and built up a vocabulary. <laughs> and it's so important, you know, because if you, when you are an artist and you writing songs and you're releasing songs, you can find yourself easily trapped into like, oh, I said that like five songs ago. Like two years ago, I said the exact same thing. But you wouldn't if you're educating yourself constantly by just reading. And I think it's really important. So great I, stuff. I've said a lot that if you have an idea worth writing one song about, then you have an idea worth writing a hundred songs about until you've said that idea every way possible. So it, it, it's like, but artists sometimes go, oh, I already wrote that idea. Okay, you might have written about the idea, but did you write it every way that you can possibly think to write it at every tempo, at every vibe, right? Because if it's worth writing a song about, then write it every single way and and, and that type of thing. And to speak to the tech, it's still just the good songs that the tech picks up. TikTok yeah. is taking viral songs viral because they're dope songs. There's very few songs that you actually hear. You go, oh, that's terrible. It's like, no, that's an idea that connected with millions of people and TikTok was just the platform that did it. Yeah. Uh, so the tech is still working on the songs, man. Well, we got to jump in. We got another song to review. So let's jump in and uh, and do that. And Erskine, stay on with us. And, and we want some peer feedback here. So be right back. <laughs> Surrounded by yes men, your circle infected They just say what will please you, your safety neglected The truth can say you, but it hurts so they take it and stretch it They would correct them, but the message is painful and hectic Can't just ignore it, cut the sin smell just like I'm septic Now you the topic of discussion All right, and that was Refugee to Kid with Waterproof Friendship. Let's dive on in. What are we thinking here, folks? I mean, I, I will say, you know, at GoQ, we've had a history of hip-hop artists, and it's spanned decades and different styles within that. I will say, like, hip-hop, and especially CHH, which I think is where this artist wants to be in a little bit, is a really, really hard place to be in right now because there's a ceiling to it. If you look in CHH right now, yeah, NF and Lecrae are at the top. Just in Spotify, right, in general, look at their monthly listeners. But even between those two, there's a massive gap. And then after Lecrae, there's a couple right. that are sitting under him. And then the, everybody else is kind of sitting in this like 250 to like 400,000 range. You know what I mean? And then there's just like a ton below that. And so right. there's a bit of a ceiling. You know what I mean? Like, and it makes it really, really hard for that genre right now for those artists. And so the thing I would press on in that is say, man, like your hook's got to be really, really stinking good. It's got to yeah. be really, really good to punch through because there's just so much volume in that community right now. And it takes a lot to to rise above it you know what i mean and and part of that to me is hooks you know that's why i think grits was one of the best chh artists we've ever had in our industry because you know they did two records where there was their first record was more of like a jazz hip-hop record you know it was really jazzy and the second record was kind of that and then by the third record they started really getting into just like solid solid hooks and yeah. and because hip-hop the the trends and what's popular go in and out so much and they change so much it's like man that hook has to be really really memorable it's, and, yeah it's got to be hot um, 
and it's got to be quick and you've got to really separate from the pack like yeah. that you are really really talented and like doing something really special and it's not to say that anybody who's going and getting started doesn't have that talent it's just it's really like about showing that you've got it Erskine what's some some peer-to-peer that you got for Refugee the Kid here yeah so I love you know the intent of the song man it was they were, they were definitely on that CHH perspective trying to present a message and I love the way that the genre is able to kind of preach to you I did feel at times though that I was listening a little bit too long for where's the hook going to be and not really certain as to where I was going to you know give the attention of my ear to yep. and I listened to lyric after lyric after lyric after lyric and it seemed like it just kind of elongated and never really got to that that place of emphasis and so just kind of finding out where those those hit zones are yep. lyrical development there so that like we said I, I love it and like we said before earlier on the podcast listen this is called practice the pitch the things that are happening right here artists paying attention you're paying attention to what's going on in the scene you're looking for review you're getting out there you're connecting you're submitting your songs that's great now it's about taking it to the next level and applying these things and then also sometimes you get advice and you go i don't know that doesn't it's not what i'm trying to do or whatever and you and you take it you consume it and then you move forward and either go hard on the thing that you're like no that they they're i'm not going to take that advice i'm going to keep doing exactly what i'm doing okay then go harder on what you're doing to bring that in because that's sometimes the way to go because it just means it's not quite connecting yet and then you know the other piece is like you know realizing man the competition is steep and it's going to be about community right so i think for especially in hip-hop and especially like any sort of christian hip-hop it's like build community and collaboration and with other people and if you can get you know five or six people together that are all crushing it maybe in your region or your area that are all collaborating and stuff it's going to start you're going to start to level up so much quicker and that's the stories that we hear is just about like surround yourself with people who are better than you and that you know are better than you and are intimidating because you got to level up and and that's hard to do but that's that's what you got to do that's what i love about nashville it's hard i mean erskine you're in east nashville you walk down the street you throw a stone there's a songwriter or somebody who's just crushing it and so we get a lot of opportunity to level up around here right so hey i want to thank you both for joining me today and doing practice the pitch everybody viewing thanks so much if you want your song in here you never know how it's gonna go you might get you know oh it's gonna go great like oh you got a hit here run with it maybe some really meaningful feedback that's the point practice the pitch.com i want to encourage everybody to be well take care of each other erskine if you can leave us just with one piece of encouragement and brad i'll i'll have you close us out with a piece of uh encouragement of where we're going this year Love to hear yeah that. so very pointed to me is that there's so many opportunities that are out there maybe felt like there was a limit to the number of things that we were able to do as artists but, but you know you'd mentioned tiktok on this show but there's so many other avenues in the the streaming world sync world that are out there that are available for artists just really is a kind of a golden age maybe a renaissance period with the reshuffling that's taken place uh, for artists and so the resources are out there and the networks are available and yeah just a, a season to take advantage of those things i love that thanks brad yeah i would second that man i think right now things are kind of resetting a little bit i know a lot of artists that are doing house show and house tours and playing for small groups and it's kind of taking it back to what it was a long time ago and building your fan base and your community that way and i would encourage artists to go after that focus on your songwriting develop your community play small intimate shows it's not about the 10,000 person show anymore right now right it's not about yeah. just getting on the dopest tour or whatever it's about like you just got to play songs you got to connect with people on a one-to-one level and mm-hmm. this whole time right now has kind of brought it all back to that so it should be an encouraging time for people absolutely completely agree well thank you all so much and be well everybody thanks for watching